My name is uh, Eric Belair. I am with uh, DuPont Image Solutions, uh, and uh, I uh, really thank you uh, all for uh, joining today. And uh, as we will be talking about high performance textile pigment inks for sustainable digital printing. And I started by saying uh, good morning. I should have said good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It is uh, morning my time, but many of you are, of course, on different time zones. And again, really appreciate that you're uh, spending time to uh, be uh, with me this morning. And so we can have a, a good discussion uh, on uh, digital printing and specifically textile pigment. So uh, for the rest of uh, uh, the uh, next 45 minutes, I will be uh, giving you some introduction on inkjet inks, on textile printing. Uh, but before I do that, what I want to do is, is kind of tell you the, the, the state of the market and uh, the digital textile market evolution as we see it. And I think most of you who are participating in it, it is not a surprise to you when I tell you that uh, di digital textile is growing worldwide. And it's growing because there's a lot of market drivers that we're experiencing, such as uh, short runs, such as the, the desire for people to order online, the flexibility people want. You know, we are ever more demanding as far as the designs that we want uh, on the garments that we have, be them t shirts or uh, fancy uh, dresses, etc. But you know we want this, but we also want to make sure that we don't have to pay an inordinate amount of price to to obtain those. So value is important to us. Another thing is we tend to want things quickly, and so production proximity to a consumer is something of importance uh, for a lot of people. But uh, a key piece that I want to uh, I will be stressing this morning. Uh, and this afternoon and this evening for some of you is around environmental regulations and our desire, not just the regulation, but our desire uh, to lower the environmental impact of what we do on a daily basis. So, uh, you know, where is the market today? The market uh, on a digital textile basis is at about 6% of the total uh, textile market. So it's a small amount, which means there can be a lot of growth. Uh, some one of the aspects that is limiting the growth of a digital textile printing, especially in Western Europe and in North America, is the limited cut and sew capacity. It's great that you can print fabric, but if you can't make anything out of it, uh, the advantage of digital kind of disappears. A lot of people are looking at single pass as the magic wand to go and take digital printing from you know a small percentage to a much larger percentage, thinking. You know, this will the efficiency of single bus is going to enable uh, growth of digital textile printing. But if you, uh, as I think some of you are involved in that, the counter to this is you need orders that can justify uh, this type of, of productivity. And then the final one, which is, of course, a key one for us to discuss today, is what about roll to roll pigment ink on the digital side? We've been talking about it for the last 10 years, and yet it's maybe two or three percent uh, of the digital uh, of the digital textile printing market. So still a very small piece. Why isn't it breaking through? And, and what are some of the things that we can do together to to help it uh, move forward? So that's really what I'm going to talk to you about today. On the right, you can see a couple of charts that indicate that you know we are in a growth industry. Uh, and there are a lot of opportunities for us uh, to take advantage of pigment inks. So where's the negative? Well, the negative on the textile printing side is is we're not we're making the news, but we're not always making the news in a positive way. And I just gave uh, examples there of headlines of articles, and you can see these articles from uh, come from different type of media, news, business and also fashion, okay? And all of them come with that same concern, is what is this environmental cost of our desire to have pretty clothing, basically, right? We want comfortable clothing and we want it to look good. There's a negative side to it, and the negative side is the environmental impact. And so the question, and I think what we wanna make sure is part of the discussion uh, today, is that there is a way of redu reducing 
the environmental impact uh, for uh, textile printing. And digital printing is clearly one of those ways. So, you know, as recap, you know, the trends that are fast shaping our, our fashion industry is the shorter season, online, uh, and sustainability. So, how do we do this? How do we get everything that we're trying to accomplish? And uh, what I want to discuss in more detail is that we feel that digital printing is the, one of the ways that we can use and a very efficient way so you can significantly lower your environmental impact and yet deliver what your customers are looking for and what the market trends are telling you your customers are looking for. So um, what are the techniques that are used today or the, the manufacturing processes that are used today to, to print? Uh, I'm sure all of you and, and most of you who are here uh, on this uh, call, you're familiar with them. I just wanted to make sure to list them. Uh, on the analog side, the non-digital, uh, you have rotary screen printing, flatbed screen printing. You know, this is for the print on fabric. And then the screen printing from garments, garments which is typically done on oval machines, uh, you know, using screen techniques. On the digital side, uh, I have, you know, three categories of equipment roll-to-roll -roll digital printing, and, and uh, I could have had a couple of them here as single pass machine look much different than what I'm picturing here. Uh, but, uh, you know, most of the machines look like the one that you're seeing here uh, on the roll-to-roll -roll side. And then in uh, on the t-shirt side, you have the platen TTG systems and you have the oval DTG systems, right? And so these are the things that you will encounter in uh, the, the the main technologies that are being used for uh, digit for printing of fabrics. Now within digital printing, uh, not all inks are equal uh, for from a standpoint of of workflow. For those of you, of course, who are familiar um, with uh, digital printing in textile, you know that uh, for each type of fabric, there is a specific ink chemistry that is appropriate, right? So uh, typically, right, uh, reactive and a pigment go on cotton, uh, drag dispersion, dye sub will go on polyester, acid will go on nylon and sink and silk, etc. cetera. Uh, and so there's more details and possibilities. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about pigment and what pigment can do. Uh, as pigment actually is the one ink chemistry that has the flexibility to reach not just cotton, but also uh, polyester and, and other types of fabric. But the, the point I'm making in this uh, chart is even on the digital side, which is already uh, has, a, as we'll see, will have a positive uh, impact on, the, on your environmental impact, uh, on your environmental footprint, the workflow is quite different. If you take, you know, reactive and acid, this is the ones that both include steaming and heavy industrial washing. So uh, there is a chemical uh, environmental impact associated with reactive and acid. Direct disperse has it also, although at a lesser, um, on a lesser uh, scale, dye sublimation and pigment are the two with the lowest environmental impact and the simplest workflow. You know, to, to put it in simple terms with sublimation, of course, if you do a print on paper, you print on paper, then you transfer to the paper and you're done. There's no water involved. In pigment, some choose to have uh, a light rinse, but you don't have to. And most of the pigment processing is done with just um, printing and then, then doing the heat treatment, the heat fixing on the fabric uh, following that. So much more reduced uh, workflow for both uh, dye sublimation and pigment. On the economic view, we have to look at two things. We have to look at the investment associated with the printing process, and you have to look at the cost, the, the, the per unit cost when you're actually doing the printing. So let's first deal with the investment side. On the investment, what we have there is some ranges, and, and uh, please uh, understand that there are some very wide ranges in some of these equipment, 
But it gives you, I think, an idea on both the equipment dollars and the facilities, meaning the building and other amenities that you will need and utilities that you will need to include uh, if uh, you're starting from, uh, you know, from, from a green site that has nothing on it, right? So the equipment for a rotary screen is uh, more than $250,000. It can, can go up from that. From a silk screen, it can vary. You can have a much smaller one uh, to about 25K up to 200K. By the way, the facilities for the rotary screen, is the cost is very high. From the silk screen, the facilities uh, cost is going to be low. If you move now to the inkjet, on the roll-to-roll -roll inkjet, you have some of the smallest, I would call it entry-level uh, machines that can be in the 20s, but the majority of these machines are in the $200,000 range. But the facilities around it are, I would say, medium as far as the dollars involved. And uh, but by the way, I put high, low, medium, low. You can imagine that depending on which area of the world, these cost of facilities will vary uh, humongously. So it's difficult for, for me to give you a dollar number at that stage. And then in DTG, uh, the cheapest, uh, the lowest priced uh, DTG machine you can find today, as far as I'm aware, is around $3,000. But you can buy them for 250 and up, you know, for some of the more uh, complex uh, industrial DTG machines. But the cost of facilities around it is small. Okay, so that's one aspect is investment. Second aspect is running costs. So I know several of you are going to be disappointed here because I am not going to give you what is the exact running cost of digital textile printing. Not am I going to tell you what is the run length at which uh, transitioning from digital to analog uh, makes sense, right? Or vice versa. And the reason I can't exactly give you that is it's really going to depend on your application, your setup, your investment, the speed at which you run, the type of fabrics you're using, it, the, the, the length of the runs that you're going to be using, et cetera, et cetera. Right, so there's a lot of moving parts here, but the important thing is what is represented in this chart, which is for digital, the cost on a square yard basis is the same if you print, you know, 20 square yards or 20 square meters, or if you print 2,000, it's the same. There is no setup cost. Of course, on the analog side, the setup cost gets amortized with the amount of, of printing that you do. And so the more you print, the cheaper it is. That's that's the, the idea. So what we're doing on the digital side, of course, is trying to figure out how low can we get this cost you know, per square meter or cost per square yard so that you can be as profitable and as uh, successful in your own business. So that's the challenge here. Uh, and and it has been a challenge for digital, but as you know, uh, over the last 10 years, the cost of printing digital has really, really decreased and uh, will continue to do so. So let's go a little more uh, closer into the analog versus digital on the environmental side. And, and there the picture uh, is, is very clear. If you look at all the key components of what an environmental footprint is. Water consumption, carbon emissions, energy consumption, and waste materials, which means it's not just that you're using water for cooling, is that in waste materials, most of the time, the water itself will be washing away some chemicals that then have to be managed, you know, either through treatment, et cetera, uh, but there has to be some kind of activity. And if you look in all these categories, digital printing compared to uh, the traditional way of, of, um, uh, of printing is much, much more uh, environmentally um, positive, right? So 60% uh, lower water consumption, 95% carbon emissions, 55% energy, and 85% waste materials. This is, this is a very significant difference, right? So of course, the numbers will vary by fabric and common chemistry, right? And the one thing I want to say is, the uh, from uh, from the the creation of a fiber all the way to a garment, 
I am only talking about the printing step, right? I am not talking about the fabric, uh, you know, the making of, of the yarn. I'm not talking about the making of the fabric. All that would have to be on a different environmental report card. This is really focusing on the printing step because that's the step uh, we as an ink uh, supplier to the digital textile printing industry are involved in. And this is where we, we can make our impact. So where does aqueous pigment ink stand in all this? Okay, we've talked about the economic size. It's the economic side. There's no post-process capital investment cost, right? So you will have, uh, your costs are, are gonna be around calendaring or uh, an oven to do the, the uh, treatment of, of the uh, textile. And typically you have those as part of your operation. Again, the setup time is limited. Uh, the, one of the, the beautiful things I always point out about you know, digital printing is, the ink that you get in January, in June, and in September, and whether you print in Brazil, you print in China, you print in India, or you print in France, it's all going to look the same. And so the, you, the, your setup time, your, your tuning, if you want your equipment, that time goes away because it, every time it is the same. Of course, if you have a reliable ink supplier, and if the ink is the same every month, and I can assure you, if if uh, you get your ink from uh, from Dupont, that is exactly what you will be getting. On the application side, uh, it is, by the way, and that's the 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 interest of pigment inks. It is applicable to all fabrics. Now, it's not as successful with all fabrics, and most of the success is today with cotton and cotton polyester blends. But as you know. Uh, there's possibilities also of printing on polyester, and there's always progress being made about using pigment on polyester. So, uh, you know, very interesting uh, from a media standpoint, of course. And then the UV fastness, you know, it's a pigment versus a dye. That's inherent physics uh, of pigments versus dye. So it has a better UV fastness, okay? And social impact, this is what we just came from no wastewater, less power consumption, no hazardous chemicals, really a very positive um, uh, picture here, you know, from aqueous pigment inks uh, for textile printing. So how do we get that ink on fabric? So I'm gonna do a little bit of a, of a science uh, parenthesis here and, and talk to you about inkjet technology because I, I do want you to understand the depth and the complexity of the technology that is behind water-based inkjet inks. You know, to, uh, so those who, of you, and, and I have been now 10 years, over 10 years, nearly 11 uh, in this business. Uh, when I first discovered inkjet inks, I did not realize the complexity of it. And I was, you know, pretty naive about uh, what was, what made one ink different versus another. So I'm gonna take you a little bit in the back room here and, and show you a couple of aspects that I think are interesting about inkjet, inkjet technology. First, you know, if you compare with analog printing processes, and I've listed those on the right, uh, analog printing processes are contact technology. You basically bring the ink and press it, in a sense, into contact with your fabric. Inkjet is different. It's a non-impact process. You have a nozzle plate, and from that nozzle plate where you have a whole bunch of holes where the ink is coming from, the ink is jetted and, and you can see there a picture of uh, what is going on. And every dot that you see there is a drop of ink. And these droplets eventually reach uh, the substrate, which is your fabric and, and creates the color, okay? So you can imagine that um, it's a very different uh, process than when let's think about it from a silk screen standpoint, where you basically push the ink through a, a screen and deposit it you know, with pressure onto the surface of a fabric, very different. The other thing that I always like to point out is the viscosity of inkjet ink. It is water-like. So um, if you hear, and if I mention in the rest of the talk, low viscosity, medium viscosity, and high viscosity, for those of you who are used to, let's say, screen and offset ink, 
I might be inducing you to, to think the wrong way in a sense that for us, you know, 10 to 12 centipoise is high viscosity. You know, what's low viscosity is three to five, three to six. So uh, understand that again, we have here a water-like viscosity for inkjettings. So that's the important thing uh, for you to understand is I basically I'm dealing with something that looks and, and feels like water. Another interesting thing about inkjet printing by the numbers, right? Think about the frequency. You remember these drops that you saw in that picture? Well, the frequency is from about, let's say, I mean, it's rarely as low as 10 kilohertz to two hundreds of kilohertz. So the number of droplets that are coming out per second is just phenomenal. Okay, it's just uh, literally mind boggling. And, and when you remember the size of that, um, uh, the, uh, that ink, it, this is on a drop volume basis, one to 50 picoliters. And, and one picoliter, if you're not uh, aware of it, is a trillionth of a liter. So these are very, very, very small drops, okay? And so this water-like substance, the inkjet ink, has to have the ability uh, to be ejected in such a small quantity. So, uh, by the way, the, the dots that you create from these uh, droplets are about 30 to 150 microns in diameter. And I'm not going to go into the, the, the science of what we call crashing, but the, it's very important, as we'll talk about uh, shortly, for the ink uh, drop to remain together while it's traveling from the nozzle to the fabric, but the instant it reaches the fabric, we actually want it to spread and crash, as we call it, as the color itself needs to separate itself from the water. Uh, so uh, really a fascinating science behind all this, okay? And if you say, well, how much ink do I put on a square meter? It can be as low as three to five grams. It really depends uh, on the type of, of um, uh, picture that you're making and how much color you need. And if it's, for example, on a uh, t-shirt, uh, you know, on a cotton t-shirt that you're printing where you're putting white ink first and then color ink on top, all these will be different. And then finally, uh, if you're not still convinced that, you know, these nozzles are pretty small and this, ink drops are pretty small. I have a picture of, of a hair. That's that big beam that you see there in dark next to nozzles. And you can see the, the, the nozzle size versus the hair. So we are talking about very small stuff. So a lot of science has to be packed in this to make it work. So talking about science, uh, how are inks developed? Uh, the way inks are developed is we take market input, right? So, um, you know, part of what I'm doing today is talking to you, talking to you about um, pigment uh, inkjet ink. Unfortunately, the dialogue, of course, you know, through a webinar is a little bit more complex, although we'll have Q&A at the end, which will uh, enable us to do some of that. But at uh, trade shows, when we visit customers uh, through your emails, we get a lot of market input. And from those, we, we put them together into what we call CTQs, which means critical to quality. So it's critical to your quality, not ours, but yours, what is important to you. Uh, and from that, we develop a product concept. And as we develop the product, we set up the specifications. Now, the key components of ink development. Uh, so I included there, in case you were looking at dye inks, we're gonna be focusing today on pigment inks. So for pigment inks, key components is pigment dispersions, uh, which is basically putting together pigment in a way that uh, the color is uniquely distributed, is evenly distributed, and polymers, uh, which give you the durability. Uh, and uh, on top of that, we need some formulation components, surfactants, deformers, et cetera, et cetera, including biocide, uh, which is a requirement uh, in, in many applications, as, as nobody likes to think that uh, there's bacteria growing in, in your ink bottle, right? So formulation components are part of that. We take all this uh, and uh, in parallel, we have to know regulatory compliance. What is the regulation uh, that is governing these type of chemicals? Uh, making sure product stewardship, that there's no impact on one, the people who process 
with Onyx and two with you who are using it. Very important for us to make sure that all that is taken care of. We are a very ethical company and therefore uh, patent clearance is very important. We do not want to uh, be violating the, the intellectual property of, of other companies. And of course, something that you, I know you care about is we care about our costs so we can have a competitive pricing in the end that delivers the value that you need so you can be successful with your customers. So that's a lot of work, right? And uh, then you come up with an ink, but then the ink itself is not enough. You need to know how to use that ink. So we also develop the process uh, to deliver, uh, you know, the, the picture that you're looking for with this ink. So that's kind of a, uh, the way we do that. A quick uh, uh, thing, I've, I've been telling you that this is very water-like. And some of you might be thinking, okay, so in a liter of ink, how much solids might I have in that ink? And what this is really the, the key uh, information from this uh, composition is in, uh, in, in inkjet ink, you typically have, you know, for textile about 15%, one five, 15% of the composition that is solids. And that's combination of the pigment dispersion and the binder. Okay, the other components are water and co-solvents, surfactants and additives, right? So that's kind of, of the way uh, uh, ink is. So um, if you, you know, now, uh, you know, next time somebody asks you, do you know how much solids are in ink? You can answer, it's 15% or less. And there's a reason it won't be much more than 50%. Remember back to the nozzle size, you have to jet that ink through that nozzle on a regular basis. The more solids, the more problems you're going to be exposing yourselves from clogging and also from wear of the printhead. So all these things are extremely important in the design of ink. Now, it would be easy if all these things all worked in the same direction, meaning, you know, I want good jetting and reliability. I want a uh, great image, I want durability, I want my ink to be stable. Um, you know, in this chart, I, I show in these things that the key, the key aspects that we're looking for in designing an ink. And then in black on, on the words on the side, I'm telling, giving you the knobs, right? So, you, you know, you can improve your jetting reliability by having a different binder uh, in, in the ink. Uh, you can also do it, you know, through the dispersion. The print image quality, again, the binder is important. The colorant, you know, how much colorant you put in there. The pretreatment, that will impact it. All these things uh, are important. Here's the challenge. Sometimes if you improve one, you damage the other. Okay, that's the balancing performance that I want to talk about. So uh, in the next chart, I illustrate that. Uh, I illustrate that, and, and we're going to go through a couple of those. Um, you know, to, to uh, give you an idea of what is the challenge that we have from uh, ink formulation standpoint and how we resolve it. So let's look at the uh, bottom left chart. The bottom left chart has on the x-axis uh, the ratio of pigment to dispersant. So a dispersant is what you put into a dispersion to make sure that your different individual uh, uh, pigment um, uh, particles do not agglomerate. You want an even distribution, right? And you want it to literally stay in a dispersion. You don't want it to collapse on itself. So you need some dispersant. And, uh, but you also need pigment. So uh, the question is, how do I optimize it? And I'm sure all of you want the most beautiful, bright colors, and you want to put the least amount of ink to accomplish that. So for that, you would want to maximize the amount of pigment. And what you can see there is as you increase the amount of the pigment over dispersant ratio, initially stability and jettability go up. Now throughout this, the OD, the optical density, so the amount of color literally goes up because there's more pigment. That makes sense. The problem is once the pigment to dispersant ratio becomes too high, both, it has an impact on two things. One, jettability, two, stability of your ink. These are not things that you want to see happen. So the formulation window 
uh, is the place where you've maximized the color while yet being also at the, the, the top performance for jettability and stability. So that's one example. Another example is the amount of polymer in ink. And a lot of the, the, what the polymer does, uh, in this case, the, the, the aspect that the polymer is contributing to that I'm focusing on is the durability. This is what helps the color, the colorant, which is the pigment, stay stuck to uh, your fabric, right? And the polymer plays a, a role to that. It, it basically uh, puts hooks into the fabric, you know, and links that colorant to the fabric and helps it stay on, you know, whether you wash it, you know, whether uh, it, you, you, um, you wear it and to perspiration and all that, the polymer is going to help you with the durability. So the idea is the more polymer, the more the durability. You see that blue line goes always on the positive side. But the more polymer, which is a solid, the higher your viscosity. Remember the comment on viscosity, you have to, to, to be careful about how viscous your ink is. Why? Well, it's reliability, meaning now that if your viscosity is too high, and this, by the way, will change depending on print heads because different print heads are uh, designed for different viscosities. There's a moment where the reliability of your ink is going to uh, decrease. Again, there, you want to find the sweet spot, you know, for the application that you have. And below, the same type of, of, um, uh, of, of reasoning goes for the percent of colorant, same way there, you have to make a um, compromise so that your jetting experience, decap is a negative, uh, uh, you know, decap is a measure of your jetting experience and how often you have to clean, uh, in a sense, your, your, your nozzles. Um, but basically is if you put m more colorant, your decap performance goes down. So you got to make sure that your printing experience is not damaged because your resulting print looks brighter. So all these things are, are key. And the, the next slide is a, a, is a pictorial uh, demonstration of, you know, what happens when you do it wrong, right? And uh, of course, we're doing this over the, um, over the phone and, and over the computer. So I can't show you fabrics that have been printed uh, you know, with issues in reliability, uh, issues in bleed control. Uh, I can't show you how uh, color, when it's the ink crashes right at the surface, you know, how you have uh, more deep colors versus if your uh, ink goes too much through the fabric and then you lose that color and, of course, the brighter colors. But that's the idea, right, is all these things I talked about, you're going to see a difference in how your print is gonna look like, not just how your process looks like. One other aspect that is important is pretreatment. And uh, um, by the way, DuPont makes inkjet inks not just for the textile market, we also make inkjet inks uh, for uh, the home and office market. We make inkjet inks for what we call the commercial uh, print on paper and the packaging market. Uh, and so, um, Having that experience of printing on a variety of media in a variety of applications, we've learned a lot about all the different components of printing. And pretreatment is another important one. And um, I can tell you one of the the next um, uh, the next generation of inks that, that we are working on are inks that will work on flexible film. And flexible film, if you think there's a challenge of printing on fabric. Think about a flexible film that has never met the drop of water that it likes. And so you need to uh, deposit that color and eliminate the water, uh, you know, without uh, damaging the print and the substrate. So quite a bit of a challenge. And there I can, what I'm showing there is that you have to tailor your pretreatment to the type of film because film, you know, is polymeric, of course, but they're all different types. And so you'll have to know between the ink you're using the, and the, um, the flexible film, what to use. It's the same principle in textile fabric. And depending on pretreatments, and there you're seeing pictures from A, B, and C, 
depending on your pretreatment, the end result is going to be looking looking very different. It could look very different from an intensity of the color. You can see pretreatment B there. I don't see as much color. The color doesn't show as much, right? The the ink kind of penetrated the fabric, uh, and the pretreatment C shows you much clearer uh, definition, etc. So all these things matter uh, from um, uh, a print standpoint. A unique case in the DTG, DTG pretreatment, uh, you know, which is of course print on t-shirt, is that uh, with cotton, you have fiber models with threads that extend out perpendicular to the bundle. And as you know, when you print on a dark shirt, you first have to print a white layer. Well, if you want a nice opaque white layer, uh, it's very important not to have these fibers sticking out because if they do, after you print your white layer and on top of that you print your color, you'll see your picture, the, the accuracy if you want, the picture definition will be much less. So there, not only is it important to have the right pretreatment, there is a step there where you have to actually mat down uh, with a, a press, right, a, and a heat pretreatment. You have to mat down your, your um, t-shirt to make sure and enhance uh, your picture. So the, the reason I bring all this pretreatment is ink is really important and, and it has a, a huge contribution in what you're going to see in the end result. But it's not just ink, right? Pretreatment is important also. So there's a lot of aspects that are important. By the way, um, here's the good news is, is we have uh, in, in DuPont, people have been working on textile inks for now uh, 20 years. And so we are always ready to help you uh, with your questions on how to best apply our inks and how for you for you and your specific application uh, get the maximum result. Another aspect uh, is the jetting reliability. I've, I've, if you recall now several slides back, we were talking about um, the ink uh, drop. Well, it's really important for that ink drop to arrive at the right place. And if it doesn't, then your picture is going to be fuzzy, okay? And things can be going wrong because of the equipment, but things can be going wrong because of the ink itself. If the ink is not formulated right, instead of a beautiful <clears throat> ink drop, You'll have ink, an ink drop plus satellite, and these satellites could go just about anywhere, okay? And that's what you can see here uh, in that next picture is in that first slide, although it looks like uh, an ink drop is being generated, it's actually two ink drops. When you have that, that is going to be a problem on your print, okay? In the right uh, most pictures, uh, ink C, there's a main ink drop and then there's like a trailing smaller satellite. Same, you will have an impact on the definition of your picture. You want like ink B, which is a beautiful one dot droplet, okay? This is some of the technology that is behind inks. All right, uh, more in the technology that's behind inks. DuPont's been in polymers since the 1920s. Polymers are uh, part of two components in the pigment engine inks. The uh, dispersant in the dispersion, uh, which helps, again, the uh, making the dispersion homogeneous and stable. And you can see below a, a situation where if you have a standard dispersion and you let it sit, uh, how uh, when you start increasing the amount of dispersion, uh, the amount of solids in the dispersion, it starts separating. Whereas with the cross-link dispersion, which is one of the technologies that DuPont uses, you can increase uh, the amount of solids and your dispersion re remains very stable. So that's one aspect. And the other aspect is the durability. And that's of course very important um, uh, for you so that your garment looks like it's printed for uh, a long time and through a lot of usage and wash. So what is it that uh, we have to offer for uh, you in, in the world of uh, inkjet inks? So uh, we have a full uh, offering in the DTG side from low to high viscosity. 
Um, in uh, also on the high viscosity side, we have a gamut expanders. So if you're trying to put less color uh, and or reach some colors that are maybe difficult, we have some colors to offer to you. Uh, we have uh, been one of the pioneers, of course, on the DTG side, and our white ink is very well known for industry for its opacity and, of course, its unique consistency. You know, you you uh, you can depend on us uh, with our white ink, uh, and uh, the results are always the same and always uh, very good. On the roll-to-roll -roll side, a very similar story. We have a very broad offer from low to uh, high viscosity. Um, from, from both on the medium viscosity and high viscosity, we, we have a, a variety of gamut expanders, okay? And um, these inks are, of course, uh, can be used for apparel, for home textile, home furnishing. So a lot of great applications for that. And uh, I will uh, go into a little more detail on one of our latest um, ink set that we have to offer, which is DuPont Artistry P2700, mid, mid viscosity. Um, we already had an outstanding ink set for high viscosity called P3600 with very good results. But if you look now on the Croc fastness and we're using ISO 105X12, in this slide, it details in, it gives you in detail how things are done. And you can see that the wet crock in every single case is better than four. That is one of the negatives people have been saying about uh, inkjet ink. You can't get to that type of a, a, a result for wet crock. So, uh, and, and we're not compromising the color values. If you look today, at, you know, below on the color saturation of the L star, we have some very good results and very beautiful prints. So. Unfortunately, I won't be able to see any of you at FESPA Madrid uh, because it has been canceled, but um, um, we will uh, be, of course, in, in uh, trade shows uh, throughout the year. And of course, do not hesitate to contact uh, your local uh, DuPont uh, sales representative. They'll, they'll be happy to send you some samples and work with you if you're interested in this technology. Again, outstanding uh, crock fastness uh, for P2700. Now, you know, we always want to point out things. Uh, I talked to you earlier about pretreatment. Here's something that's important is color fixation methods for uh, pigment inks. People use different techniques, stentor frames or hot air dryers or calendars, okay? Some use IR, it's not commonly used today, but it's really important that in here uh, to, to achieve the results that we're talking about, uh, you can undermine the performance if the pretreatment is not done right, if the car fixation is not done right. So all that has to be integrated the right way. And again, here's the good news. We have a technical team that's that can uh, be there to help you, to guide you. Uh, and we work with partners in the industry. Uh, also, if you uh, uh, obtain your ink through one of our distributors that will help you be successful. So uh, there is science behind this success, right? And it's important to do it right. But I think if you do it right, I think you will be very pleased with the results for you and your business uh, and the growth that will uh, um, be resulting. And another component that we have is we make sure that, uh, you know, part of the CTQs that we have is we look at the type of regulations that you live in in your industry. So uh, we make sure that our formulations abide by those so that you can sell your product in as many applications as possible. And so we're always looking at that uh, as we uh, put together the inks that we have. And we can provide you that information to make sure that we are certified for the specific um, uh, NGO that you're considering, okay? So in the end, I say, I really wanna thank you for um, uh, listening to, to me this morning. I hope that you've had plenty of questions we put in the, uh, in the Q and A. Uh, in the next uh, 15 minutes, um, we'll be uh, going for the Q and A. So I'll be looking at those and uh, uh, yeah, trying to answer them to uh, the best of my abilities. If I am not able to answer or I run out of time, do not worry. 
Uh, your questions will not be lost. We will receive them all uh, in an email form, and uh, we will make sure that our regional team, um, you know, either myself or members of our team worldwide will respond to you. Again, we have a very broad offering. Today we focused on, uh, on the um, pigment, but we have a broad offering from a standpoint of, of um, uh, inks and, and look forward to discussing that uh, with, with all of you. So uh, before I close, remember what we started as the premise. You know, We want to do beautiful prints, but we want a lower environmental footprint. This is not what our industry has always delivered. So let's help our industry deliver that. Uh, to do that, we've had to increase the print reliability. People have said it's difficult to print with pigment. With all the work we've done, we've really in, uh, increased the print reliability along with print head life. So it, all that is possible. We've also increased the print quality and made it so that the value that's delivered is sufficient for you to for your customer to be for you to be successful at your customer and and we've worked to make the workflow as simple as possible there's some tight windows there you need to learn you need to do it the right way but the workflow itself once you have fine-tuned your process is a pretty simple workflow and it will the idea is we're making it work with cotton we're making it work with cotton and polyester blends let's go beyond that that's also the next step that we are interested in doing. I mentioned, unfortunately, FESPA uh, Madrid has been canceled, but FESPA Brazil is on. So if some of you will be there uh, next week, I hope that uh, you'll go and meet our outstanding team from uh, Brazil uh, and uh, they'll be able to uh, discuss opportunities with you there. So, uh, again, this is uh, uh, closing. You see, I, I have my email, so you can send uh, a, an email to me. We'll make sure that if not myself, uh, somebody from your region will be answering. And I really appreciate uh, all of your um, all, all of your uh, attention uh, for the last 45 minutes. All right, so um, I'm uh, looking at uh, some of the questions here. Uh, and a lot of it is um, a lot of different questions. So let me answer one from uh, Dimitri Sarbaev. So uh, uh, Dimitri, you're asking, are you going to have DTG pretreatment for our dark polyester? So this is clearly one area that we are working on. Um, Again, if we had been at FESPA Madrid, I would have been able, and, and if you had attended, we would have been to show you some of the results that we have so far. So we're making some good progress and uh, 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 anticipating that uh, Drupa 2020 is on. Uh, we'll be able to uh, talk to you more about uh, what our DTG pretreatment uh, dark polyester is solution is there. So uh, stay tuned. And yes, we are working on that. Uh, I see a question on um, uh, fastness properties when using uh, pigment inkjet inks on 100% polyester fabric. So I do not have that type of data. This is uh, one of those questions that I think we'll want to um, uh, take offline. Uh, today, again, we are targeting this at a pigment at a cotton fabric. And so um, this will be very, this will vary based on the type of polyester fabric uh, that you have. I have also uh, another interesting question there it says, how do we get a sample? So uh, best way to get a sample is uh, if we know you're interested, of course, we have a website uh, and, and you can uh, reach our, our artistry uh, website. And uh, if, um, if you, uh, that's one of the, the options to do there and request that or you can connect with our, our local teams. So again, by providing us your information through this webinar, we will make sure that uh, one of your, um, you know, our local team will get in touch with you and will connect with you, okay? Um, I have a question here that says, are digital and sublimation inter, inter interchangeable words so no so digital printing uh, basically means that uh, you know you're printing using inkjet and that the signal about when to print that drop 
comes from a digital signal. Basically, the computer is telling the printer what to print, when to print it. It is not a physical uh, device like it's done in the screen printing that uh, decides where your ink goes. So that's what the digital component means. Sublimation means uh, it's part of dye sublimation. Dye sublimation is one chemistry uh, of dye-based inks where you make uh, a, a dye-based ink that you can sublimate. So the, the way the color transfers you know, from the ink to the surface is through sublimation, which means it goes from the liquid phase to the vapor to the uh, gas phase. Uh, that's what the solid does. And uh, then gets redis goes back into the solid phase on top of your fabric. So that's the sublimation process. And um, uh, the typical sublimation process is two step. First, you put the ink on the paper, and then through heat, you sublimate that color from the top of the paper to the top of the fabric. Okay. So you, the other part of the question is, it's difficult to control color due to the different humidity levels at Asian factories. So you're absolutely right. The, um, it is important to um, control your, the humidity in your environment. So especially where the uh, inkjet printing occurs. So if you think about it, right, remember the frequency and the size of these micro drops, right? They're very small drops. So if your environment changes, it can have an impact. So it is better to be in a humidity controlled environment so that you do not have that aspect of the environment that could impact your process. Again, it will it will have uh, the humidity changes will have a different impact depending, uh, but uh, temperature and um, humidity control are important in your or uh, in the digital printing manufacturing. So the other question there is: Are, are you Inks Equitex certified? Yes. So we have Equitex certification for all our pigment inks. And so that is uh, available. Uh, and uh, again, that is, a, um, we can provide um, the certificates upon request. Again, through contacting us or through contacting our sales team, uh, you would be able to uh, get these answers. Um, I have a question there that I know is beyond my technical uh, response. I won't be able to, to answer uh, there. This is a, a question on uh, fabric penetration. Uh, so uh, register the question and we will look at it um, uh, you know, in your specific case. Uh, there's a question on how, what are the speeds that you run at? That is really, uh, the, the, the really governing factor there is the equipment that you're using. So you have to look at the type of equipment that is being used and that's what the speed per minute uh, governs. And then when you look at your application, you might need to optimize what speed you can go to. Okay, it will depend by the pattern you're using, et cetera. Okay. Um, The pigment to binder ratio in the ink. So I don't think we necessarily disclose that. So that's a good question. So there is, uh, and, and I see there's a couple of questions on more details on the formulation. So we are more limited in, um, uh, we don't disclose this uh, uh, details of formulation typically, right? So, but as we work with customers and if there's a need to get into more details, we can always get into some uh, agreements so that we can uh, tell you about uh, more about the details. Um, there's a question says, what make of printhead in current context would be most suitable for pigment inks? There's really a very broad range of uh, printheads um, that can be used. And uh, the, again, the, the advantage that we have is that we have made inks that are suitable for uh, just about all the printheads that are um, uh, used today 
uh, in the DTG or roll to roll. So again, my recommendation is get in touch with our team. We'll put you in touch with our with our team and um, depending on what you're trying to do, they might be able to guide you one way or another. Um, but uh, from an ink standpoint, we are able to uh, really use um, our inks in a variety of print heads from the low viscosity to the high viscosity. So, and I don't want to say one name and not name another one uh, because all our all the print head manufacturers are people that that uh, we work in collaboration with clearly, and I want to wish them all equal success. Um, So can, <clears throat> can pigmenting be printed on functional fabrics, mostly polyester and synthetic fabrics? So uh, again, the uh, pigmenting has been developed mostly for cotton and cotton polyester blends. There are some situations where we can make it work uh, on, on polyester, uh, but these are kind of more unique at this stage. So it's not um, you know, broadly uh, applicable, but by working with our uh, technical team, uh, we have customers that have some solutions that they have developed for that. So that is possible. So uh, I see a couple of questions about specific printers uh, and, and people asking me, can you use DuPont ink on our printer? So uh, the, the, the way to answer that question is again, for you to uh, get uh, connected uh, with our technical team, uh, and they will be able to match uh, the ink uh, with the actual um, printer, okay, and and give you the right uh, the 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 right uh, connect. All right, so I see it's about um, a few minutes before eight. You have been extremely kind and patient, uh, listening to me uh, uh, for the last hour. Uh, I know. Uh, there's a lot of questions I'm sure I did not answer either fully or uh, did not get to. Uh, but uh, again, I thank you so much uh, for doing that. Uh, you have uh, my email and uh, we'll make sure to uh, connect you with the right people. Uh, and another thing before I exit, I just want to let you know that will be an online poll so that you can give us feedback on whether this morning's uh, webinar was of value to you. Uh, and so we really, really appreciate um, you providing us some feedback um, because we want to continue to get better. We want to continue not only in the inks we make, but also the communication that we provide you like we are today, that we improve and uh, we deliver what you need and something that ends up being useful uh, for, um, for your application, for your business. Uh, so that you are very successful. So again, uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, your kind and patient listening this morning. And uh, I hope that if this is the morning to you, you have a great day. If you have the afternoon, uh, please enjoy your, your evening and relax. And if it's already evening time, you've been most kind. Thank you so much um, for being on. And uh, now it's, it's time to... Uh, to relax and uh, and prepare for the next day. So thank you all and uh, goodbye.